don't know about you, but I was singing along with it. So it is well with our, our soul. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to encourage you to open them with me, if you will, to Mark, excuse me, John chapter 2. And John chapter 2. So we're gearing in and heading into the Christmas season where it's, my goodness, can I start over? <laughs> Summer was great, wasn't it? <laughs> that was a little too loud back there. <laughs> Easter season. Uh, we're kind of focusing on Christ and what he's doing and what he's done leading up to his crucifixion here in John chapter Excuse me, Mark chapter, where am I? I don't know. I'm in John. I'm in John. Let's pray together. <laughs> Father, thank you that you've let us laugh at ourselves. And Lord, if we can't laugh at ourselves, we have no business giving grace because you've given us so much grace that we should just laugh. And Father, I just thank you that, you, that we have made much of you and much of Christ today. And so far, Lord, we have just given you praise with song and instrument and, and giving. We've worshiped you in the way that we give. And Father, I just pray that now in these few moments that uh, you would speak through us through your word as we examine what it says and understand what it means and as your spirit convicts us as what do we need to do in response to your, what you've revealed. Lord, bless us in this time. Again, let us make much of Christ in these few moments. And I do ask this in Jesus' name, by the Spirit within, amen. We, he, here in our, our text this morning in John, we, we see Jesus is coming into the city of Jerusalem, where, where John records it as a time of Passover, and you come to Jerusalem for Passover. And in this particular moment, uh, Jesus is cleaning out the temple, uh, forming a, a whip and whipping those who are not supposed to be there out. Probably livestock and people feel the sting of his whip. And so here, and we look at this text, we'll read through, and you'll see a few things this morning and a couple of applications as we walk through this together. First of all, John chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. So the Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and he also found money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their, with their sheep and oxen. He poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews replied to him, what sign will you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Therefore, the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. While he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name and saw the signs that he was doing. This is a unique passage. This is not the typical Jesus that we see. Most often, the, the, if you Google the an image of Jesus, most often you're going to return with a very, uh, very weak looking Jesus, one with a, a lamb. And, and he is peaceful with the lamb. But here in this particular text, he is very violent and he's driven to righteous anger. And seeing what's happening within this text as he is cleansing out the temple of those who are neglecting the purpose of the temple and in turn abusing the people who are, who are there. There's a couple of things about this text that, that we need to know and I want you to understand as we, as we understand our Bibles much. Uh, the, all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, contain the moment where Jesus drives the people from the temple. 
The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the ones who see things together, place the moment in the week before Jesus is crucified. John, however, places the cleansing of the temple very early in Jesus' ministry. Well, John rec records this event e early in his ministry. Now, and why this discrepancy and why, why point this out? Well, I want to point this out, one, because I want you to know your Bibles. I want you to know what the Bible says. I don't want you to be surprised in conversation with someone and say, well, hey, the Bible says this in this place and this in that place. They don't match up. What's the deal? This is no surprise. We know this is here. I want you to wear this. We know our Bibles. These, there are, are several ways in to address this discrepancy. Real quickly, just kind of as we know our Bibles. One, we can say that uh, John is out of sync with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they have been in placing this early on in his gospel. We could say that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are out of sync with John by placing it later into the gospel. Or we could say that they were actually two separate events, two cleansing of the temples that we represented at different times. Now, we need to know, I want you to know, that there are solid, critical thinking, Bible-believing people who advocate for one event. And there are solid, critical thinking and Bible-believing people who advocate for two events. Matter of fact, I was growing frustrated in reading the commentaries when so-and-so would say this and so-and-so would say this and, and they had four or five of them out and they were disagreeing with each other. There's disagreement on, on was there one or two events, but that should not take us by surprise or set us off course or under, undergird us. We need to understand as looking at this that in the day, the chronology as, that we advocate for was not as important to some of the writers in that day, not just biblical writers, but other writers. Whereas we as a culture, when we read a history book, a biography, we expect A to follow B and B to follow C in that chronological order. And if it's off, we'd say there's something wrong with the author. In John's day, in the gospel days, not only within this literature, but other around it, having a correct chronology was not as important to the writers. They had a purpose to meet. And they would mix up dates when things happened to meet their purpose, and that was accepted as a way and a form of writing. We need to understand that because we need to understand our Bibles. Of the gospel, of all of them, Luke is most concerned with his chronology, even, but he doesn't speak of this event much just a little. Now, why do we mention that? I mention this because I want you to know your Bibles. I don't want you to be tripped up. I don't want you to be confused. I don't want you to be surprised by this. But also, I want you to understand that when this is placed, if, if John is right placing it early or Matthew, Mark, Luke are right placing it later, neither of them change what is communicated here. Their placement does not change any way we believe. Their placement does not change any way that we think. It does not make a theological difference. But I want you to be aware of this, and I want you to know this, because I want you to know your Bibles. Now notice, look closely in here. We see a time and a season in which John describes Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. He says the Passover is near. The Passover is close. And he goes up to Jerusalem. Everyone always went up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the most significant city. You always go up. To Jerusalem. In, this, in the Passover, as it gives us the shadow of this event, we need to recognize as they're coming into Jerusalem to celebrate the time in which the Lord delivered his children, the Hebrew people, out of slavery in Egypt. How after 400 years of following Joseph, that his people have been in slavery to the Egyptians, building bricks, making uh, buildings, making even pyramids, and doing these things. And as Moses was raised up by God to deliver them out, they began to do it even without straw. Moses, God used Moses to speak to, to Pharaoh and deliver 10 different plagues on him, including the last plague, the 10th plague, which is the plague of the death of the firstborn. And all of the Hebrew children, he tells Moses, Moses tells the people, gather together and take a pure and spotless lamb, sacrifice the lamb, pour, sprinkle his blood, paint the lamb's blood on the doorposts and the lentils. And then when the angel of death comes through Egypt, he'll see the blood and pass over you. Very much drawing a clear picture all the way to Christ where Christ becomes that sacrificial lamb and those of us under the blood of Jesus Christ are passed over from in death into life and freedom from slavery. This is why Jesus is coming. This is why every Hebrew within a 15 mile radius is commanded by Jewish law to migrate to Jerusalem for Passover. 
This is why those who lived in so many different places throughout the Roman world made it their desire, their, their greatest aim to come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Historians tell us that there is upwards of two and a half million people that would flood into the city of old Jerusalem during this time. You imagine two and a half million people coming to Chillicothe to see our sliced bread. Where would we do with all these people? Where would we, where would we go with them? And they're all there as Jesus is coming to the Passover and coming to the temple. The temple, which is also called Herod's temple, was a massive complex. It had a, the inner temple then had the outer court and the outer court was the court of, called, of Gentiles, meaning that if you were a non-Hebrew person, that is as far as you could go. You could go no further up into the temple. If you're a woman you couldn't even, and a Jew, you couldn't even go into the temple areas. There were certain places you were restricted there. But this is this outer court. The actual temple itself, the temple proper, was completed in 18 months, but these massive complexes continued to be, be built until AD 62, AD 63. Destroyed and flattened in AD 70. It's this outer court that Jesus comes into and he sees all of these men, all these women, all these families who have traveled some, some hundreds of miles getting fleeced by sellers of livestock and money changers. It looks like a marketplace. It looks like a bazaar. If you've ever seen on, on television or seen in person going to a, a marketplace in a, in a third world country where just people are everywhere and the sellers are calling out, hey, pretty lady, come and buy this. Hey, you need this. She really wants this. Grabbing your attention. Escalate that to what he sees here. They come into the temple. Once in the temple, every Hebrew family, every Hebrew man had to pay a temple tax and present a sacrificial animal. They're coming in here and, and it's easy to look at the scene around them and say that the livestock sellers, uh, the money changers, all those temple leaders allowed them to be there and obviously it was wrong because of how Jesus responded to it. The sellers of the, of the livestock, would often what would happen is that they would come in, if not only would a family have to bring their sacrificial lamb, their animal to dove or oxen with them, um, but they would travel for so far that some of them wouldn't bring their own. They'd get one one there that's kind of a convenience hey we don't have to take one with us you know how long it is to walk 100 miles with a lamb try it with a toddler you know it's even worse you know we just you know what it's like to do this oh what happens if we get there and the journey has been so hard on the lamb that it's now weak and blemished and the inspectors at the temple look at it and after we pay them the fee to look at the lamb and inspect it they say I'm sorry but you can't use this one you need to go buy another one it's convenient so they would come into this, into this uh, temple and they would begin to, as the sellers offered their service to the people. And, and probably he, what began as a good thing and, and it was intended to be a good thing grew into what we descri see described here as just this bizarre and marketplace as all of these people flooded into the city. They also had to pay a temple tax. They required every year to pay a temple tax. And, and the Jewish law was that every, every Jew, 19 years or older, had to pay the temple tax. A tax that could not have been paid in Roman coinage. It had to be paid in silver. But not just any silver. It had to be either paid in the Galilean coin or the temple silver. So when they come into the temple... And they're bringing their tax, they're bringing them from what, their, their money from whatever portion of the Roman Empire they're coming from, whether they're bringing local currency where they live or they're bringing Roman currency in. They come into the temple, they see the guy setting up with the changers, say, hey, you know, I have this much. And he says, well, it's going to cost you this much to change it. And this is how much the fee is going to be. And here's everything here. And so then they get, get their money. If you've ever traveled to internationally and you come into an airport, you'll see these signs that say exchange currency here. If you're ever traveling and come to the airport, don't exchange your currency there because you get a horrible exchange rate. That's what was happening here. 
Say, for instance, someone would come in and they would, they would need, they'd come in to pay the tax, which is a half a shekel. Let's just say that's worth about $5 a day, which would be a man's wage. Let's just throw a number together. So that's $5. I get paid $5 a day. The tax is $5, so it's going to cost me one day's wage to pay the temple tax every single year from the age 19 until the Lord calls me home. But I come in and I have to exchange it. Let's say once I pay for the exchange rate, it's now $8. And then once I pay the fee, it's now up to $10. So all of a sudden, coming in, knowing that I'm sacrificing an entire day's income, now it's two days income, and I barely make enough income to live half a day. Is it any wonder where Jesus was upset with the money changers and exchangers? I think what began as a good thing got twisted around it. And here, I think we need to be guarded ourselves. It's very easy to, to criticize the sellers of the livestock. It's very easy to be sympathetic for those who are exchanging their currency. But we need to remember it's very easy for us as well to begin something good and end up being a blockade for what the Lord wants to do. Jesus comes in and he, see all, he sees all of the people and all the money changing hands and it just creates this perfect opportunity for abuse. This religious system, the, the temple courtyard that had been turned into a religious bazaar, a marketplace and a religious system that exploited the poor under the guise of worship. Is it any wonder Jesus shouted out, kicking tables over, stop turning my father's house into a marketplace? Both the sellers and the buyers were part of this religious system that had lost its awe of God. And when you lose your awe of God, all that faith becomes is just a matter of keeping up the religious appearances. And that's exactly what was happening there. I come in, I need a dove. Outside the wall, it's $10. Inside the wall, it's 100 I come in, I pay my tax to the Lord, I have to give pure money, not this, this Roman currency, and it's gonna cost me two, three days wages to pay it. How am I gonna survive? And so here, just place yourself in the position of these families. We want to do what the Lord wants us to do, but this system is hurting us and keeping us from God. And not only was it keeping the Hebrew people from the Lord, it was keeping the Gentiles from the Lord, those who were non-Jews, all of us in this room, most likely. Because God, when he constructed the, gave the instructions to build the temple, he created a space for the entire world to come. Our Lord has always longed for the entire world to know his name. And even in, in using one small people in the entire world, he created a space and built within their hearts and practices a place for the entire nations to come. And here this religious system was polluting it and blockading it and turning it against what God intended it to be. But you and I must be cautious because you and I, while we may not see set up a marketplace as is done here we too can rob from the glory of God in our lives in our church and that is what is happening here the disciples remembered probably long afterwards looking back you imagine that conversation when it finally hit somebody you remember when Jesus did that and the Psalms in 69 9 says I am zealous for your my house and the reason it says so in Psalm 69 is because the context of that is, is David and he is speaking out that all the people around him are just, just violently and repulsively speaking ill of the Lord and his, his temple and his worship. And Jesus is cleansing out the temple, calling us here because of the great glory of God. Church, it is so easy it is so easy 
to get engaged in a religious system where you're doing the right things in the right way at the right time and steal and rob from the glory of God in it. And Jesus cautions us against that here in his scene. Worshippers coming to worship, they're fleeced and extorted on their way in and Jesus drives out the abusers. The lamb has become the lion. Now I want you to notice a couple of things here as we, as we think about this and apply this to this. First of all, as I mentioned, the glory of God is at stake. The glory of God is at stake. And Jesus steps into the temple, into the outer court. He sees everything that's happening. There is absolutely nothing about what is occurring that will give God glory. And folks, we as his people would long to follow after Christ and long to see the Lord's favor in our life and long to do what the Lord wants us to do. We too must be passionate about the things that Jesus is passionate about and he is passionate about God's glory in all things. That should be a marching order. What are we doing today? We're going to the grocery store for the glory of God. What are we doing today? We are, we are giving out meals to people who have nothing to the glory of God. What are we doing today? We are comforting each other for the glory of God, for God's glory is our great aim. But the problem is, as you already know this, is that sometimes we settle for the ordinary instead of living to the extraordinary glory of God. Sometimes instead of living for God's glory, we settle for a safe religion. We love Jesus as long as he doesn't ask us to risk our reputation. We love Jesus, do anything for God as long as, it call, ask, as long as he asks of us nothing greater than to give him our tax deductible donation. We will do anything for him as long as it is in the safety of my seat. Someone once said, a ship in a harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Christian, in your pew, is, life is safe, but you're not saved to live a safe life. You live to live a, a God-centered, God-glorifying, do whatever it is that cost me to do for him. For if grace cost us nothing, then we have cheapened it. We should be passionate for what Jesus is passionate about. We should be angry about what makes Jesus angry, a righteous anger. What drives his righteous anger? It's profiting off of the poor and the exploited. It's creating barriers for those to come to the Lord. It is a disregard for the nations. It is a righteous anger when we say people, only a certain people, matter. And God says all people matter. We should be angry with what Jesus is angry about. And then perhaps the last thing, and there's certainly several more we could add, and we'll close with this. I don't know about you, but I need Jesus to drive out of my life what doesn't belong. I need Jesus to take the same hands that were laid open and pierced for my, for my soul, to take the whip of himself and drive out of my life what doesn't belong. We could list off what those things could be in my life, list off what those things could be in your life, but you know what they are. The Spirit is revealing to you what they are right now. We have come to Christ and we say, Jesus Christ, as much as you love me and are passionate for me and full of grace and mercy to me, drive out of my life in my heart what doesn't belong there because it is stealing from your glory. It is robbing from, from your glory. It is robbing from the, the glory of God and it is not for my good. Drive it out for the same hands that were pierced are the same hands that form this whip and drive out the oxen, drive out the sheep, and drive out those who are exploiting God's faithful. Christian church, is the glory of God your greatest concern? 
And do you possess a safe faith or faith that, faith that will cost you much? My prayer for us is that we will risk greatly for God and however it is that he is leading us. If you're here this morning and you're not even certain that, that God is, but through this time together, the Lord has opened your heart and your ears to, to recognize that there is something in your life that is keeping you from him and that something is, is your sinful nature. And God, the Spirit is at work within you, bringing about the conviction that there is a separation between you and he. You may not be able to phrase it this way, but you understand this. There's a separation between you and the Lord, and Jesus himself has laid his life down and calling out to you, and all who respond to the call of Christ and give their life to him in faith and calling upon the name Lord Jesus will be saved. My heart here is if you don't believe that you would believe today and you would give your life to Christ. For I, I don't want you, God does not want you, to spend an eternity separated from him. If you ever give your life to Christ, if you're spending your life in religious service and missing that Jesus who calls everything from you. This is a weird story. It's not typically what we think of Jesus. Gathering the children, sitting with the lambs, all the paintings of, of um, Europe when Jesus is very, very pale and very, very glowing and looked like he wouldn't harm a fly. Here, the Gospels present Jesus zealous for the house of the Lord and the desire for us who follow after him to be zealous for God and the things of God. Beloved, let us not cheapen grace by refusing to follow after him, even if it cost us much. Would you stand with me as we pray? And we come and we sing.